So there won't be a lot here um, that's new. In fact, a lot of it is, rep um, the, even the conditions are very repetitive. Um, why is ENT relevant? Why, why do we worry about ears, eyes, nose, and throat for a, um, in emergency care? Well, these injuries or uh, illnesses related to these conditions tend to be very disturbing to people. They freak out, you know, it's their face, their eyes, very sensitive areas. And so they uh, tend to overreact a little bit with them. And so we will see these. Um, if it's the nose and the throat and mouth, well, it can have airway concerns, but um, as well as certain ear problems resulting in dizziness and falling and things along those lines. So that's kind of where we're going and why we get into this chapter or, or into these kind of conditions, even though most of them are not uh, life-threatening in the most uh, normal sense or the um, you know most commonly uh, thought of sense. All right, so uh, some of our nerves, so ocular motor, uh, optic nerve, why these are not in order, I don't know, but here we can see the nerves that are playing a role, or excuse me, the anatomy of the eye, if you remember. So tell me, tell me a little about this eye here. Um, what is a unique, what are some unique features that I pointed out during trauma about the eye and the anatomy of the eye? Things that we need to keep in mind. There are. Very good. So yeah, the big point there being the vitreous versus the aqueous. And the terms vitreous, um, higher viscosity, aqueous, very thin. Aqueous humor will regrow. Damage to the interior chamber of the eye generally will not result in permanent vision loss, but damage to the posterior chamber of the eye that results in a loss of vitreous humor can result in permanent vision vision loss. So when dealing with eye injuries or eye illness, you know, illnesses related to the eye, a big thing to keep in mind is do not apply pressure to the eye. You do not want a tight dressing or anything like that that could result in a squeezing of the eye itself. Injuries or illnesses related to the eye are often treated as an emergency um, and as a significant concern because loss of vision can have such an impact on their activities of daily li living and quality of life. So we can see the lacrimal glands, the sclera, the conjunctiva. Remember, the sclera is again is on the eye uh, ball on the orbit itself, whereas the conjunctiva is what you're going to find in the tissue around the eye. So, um, keep your patient calm. This is a very common issue related to ENT questions. Is that because, like I said before, they tend to freak out about these. So focus on keeping them calm. Other than that, your patient assessment. You're going to rule out your um, life threats. Your primary assessment very rarely are eye-related injuries going to be life threats. Do not allow them to distract you from a, some other associated illness, but we're looking at illnesses here specifically. So ask about these conditions. Do they have trouble blinking or does it fix with blinking? Uh, blurred vision, double vision, uh, pain, foreign sen body sensation. These are all things you want to look at. Look for cranial nerve function by having them track your, eye, your finger. Look for uh, pupillary dilation and constriction. Um, so most of this should be straightforward. I really am going to move through this chapter quite quickly. Um, all right, so assess the structures. You want to make sure that there's no bruising or swelling in on the orbital rim here at the eyelids. Generally, the eyelid is going to change because of the swelling on the inside of the eye, um, of the eye orbit itself. Not the orbit, the uh, globe. The orbit is the hole that it's in. Um... We are not normally going to focus on uh, visual acuity in the pre-hospital environment. Do not get hung up on that, but peripheral vision and monitoring for peripheral vision. So take your hands like this, kind of go full extension, look straight ahead, and then move your fingers forward until 
you can see or catch that there is movement in your peripheral. This kind of a process is very helpful for recognizing or for the excess assessing the field of view on your patients because a loss of field of vision can be related to a stroke. And so while it may be, may they may think that it is an eye problem, it might be a stroke problem or you might have a loss of function on one eye. For example, if your patient has a field of view that's right here on the left, but they have a field of view here on the right, you know, and their hand is this much further forward, that could be because their right eye is not actually um, functioning at the moment. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. So yeah, eye drops, uh, lubricating eye drops and things like that. If you don't have eye drops, but you feel the need to lubricate the eye, um, and it's just temp um, small amounts of lubrication, not like you have to flush and irrigate the eye, just use a saline syringe. Just uh, pop the um, seal on it first so it's not uh, gonna squirt them aggressively, but um, you can use a saline syringe for most of that. Um, generally, your patient will appreciate it more if you don't put a needle on the syringe. You can, but you know, you'll probably freak them out a little bit and risk uh, puncturing the eyeball. Um, all right. If the patient is wearing contact lenses, they've had any burns, any foreign body, any issue or anything like that with the eye, do uh, remove that contact lens uh, or have them remove the contact lens because you don't want the chemical or the foreign body getting stuck between the eyeball and the um, lens itself. Uh, we don't, I've never had on any of my apparatus a suction cup for removing contact lenses. Sounds cool, but generally if you uh, pull down with your pointer, or excuse me, your middle finger, take the middle, your middle finger, pull down on their lower eyelid and then pinch very uh, quickly and gently, uh, kind of with a pulling manner. Um, that's the best way to grab the um, contact lens off their eye. If it's a hard contact lens, you might actually be able to just uh, with a dry fingertip, it stick to your fingertip and lift it off that way. But most, I, I cannot remember the last time I met somebody who was wearing a hard lens. Most of them are soft lenses these days. And so you just pull down with your middle finger and then pinch it like that. Um, and it's the quickest way to get a contact lens off an eye. Any irritation, infection, illness, or problem associated with the eye, that contact lens should be removed. This is how you place a um, eye drop if necessary. All right, prosthetic eyes. Um, if the eye is not responding at light, if it's not moving around with the other eye, um, doesn't look exactly the same, it's very possible it's prosthesis, just ask. And I've had that embarrassment before. It was like, oh, uh, their eyes are not working. Oh, yeah, that's a false eye. Oh. Well, of course it's not working, you know, so um, if something seems off, just ask. Anybody seen one of these on their ambulance? Yep, nope, neither have I. Moving on. All right, so let's look at some of these conditions. Here's conjunctivitis. This is an inflammation of the conjunctiva. This is that clear lining that runs around the eyeball and around, and then it extends all the way around the inside of the eye um, socket underneath the eyelid and all that. The sclera is the white surface of the eyeball in the inside. The conjunctiva is that clear uh, membrane, like I said, conti continues all the way out underneath the eyelids. And it can become inflamed from many different things. It can become inflamed because you sat there and rubbed it too much. Um, so most of the time, uh, all you need are some lubricating eye drops or maybe a, possibly an, a, a steroidal and eye drop to uh, Res, uh, resolve that irritation. Antibiotics may be necessary, but not in the pre-hospital environment. You can just pretty much look at it and say, well, yeah, you have conjunctivitis. All right. Chalizion or hordium, this is these inflammations on um, the eye. This is what we would call a sty. The, um, the chalizion is not a Pokemon. This is a bump or pustule in the lower eye 
eyelid itself. Um, again, it's a block, uh, blocked gland, not necessarily a lacrimal duct. Um, whereas the um, the sty is going to be more surface, right on the border, right on the edge. And um, the best treatments for these are a warm compress. Tell them to get a rag, a wet rag uh, that's warm, a warm wet rag, and hold that on their eye. Maybe, um, but there's no other treatment or anything we're going to do. So, um, pull the door. Oh, okay. So um, that's a fairly easy way to um, treat those. These are not, um, but I've had, I've been called for these. I've responded to this kind of a complaint in the ambulance, like, oh, there's something wrong with my eye. And it's like, well, it's called a sty. You know, put a wet rag on or hot, wet compress on it. Um, so. Yeah, very rarely are antibiotics going to be used to treat these. It's an inflamed um, gland and um, sword I'm looking for. Why am I blanking on this term again? Um, pore. It's an inflamed pore. So the hot compress is what they need. All right, glaucoma. This is a actual degenerative condition within the eye itself. This is created by excessive pressure um, within the orb, um, within the globe. So in the um, posterior chamber, the eye drops that the patient will use will reduce that um, pressure and. The only thing we were wanting to do is uh, make certain that the patient isn't suffering from some form of trauma, burns, or something like that uh, before we assume that it is glaucoma. Very rarely that we will see this as the initial complaint. This is just an associated finding that results in limited vision. Um, not to be confused with cataracts, which we'll see shortly. All right. Um, retinal arterial occlusion. <laughs> this is basically a stroke of the eyeball. Long and the short of it, they'll lose vision very rapidly. Um, if they want vision restored, this is a very um, emergency situation. They need surgery right away. Um, and it can result in permanent blindness, but it's basically a stroke of the eye. So irisitis, you can see inflammation of the cornea um, and the sclera, but a lot of cloudiness across the iris. This is going to be a new onset. Um, there has to be an exposure for it to happen, though. Uh, papilledema. Um, this is a swelling of the around the eye um, in the orbit, so causing headaches. Could be caused by a tumor, abscess. Really not something that we're going to see um, very often. As you can see, there's some really interesting concerns here, but be this becomes a much less of a concern when you compare it to the cause, whether it's hypertension or meningitis or um, Guillain-Barre or something along those lines. Just skin infections around the orbit, not something we're going to really worry about. Corneal abrasions, we talked about those in trauma. So reference the trauma, you know, irrigate them, uh, keep their eye from mo moving and such, such like that. Don't uh, keep their eye closed. That way they're not uh, causing further irritation. Um, all right. So our ears, we play um, play a huge role in our life. Um, I think it's important to remember that the ear isn't just about hearing, but remember the semicircular canals. We have three of them. Um, they all set at different angles to each other. They're part of the inner ear, and they are what maintains our equilibrium. They are what tells us that they're the accelerometer or gyroscope of our body. So we know if we're sitting upright, if we're moving, if we're accelerating, decelerating, that kind of a thing. So any inf ear, uh, inflammation of the ear can have a result, have a negative impact on our balance um, and equilibrium. So here's your anatomy of the ear. This should be review again. Here you can see the semicircular canals. Notice the three of them at a different angle there, those loops 
that are opposite of the cochlea. And um, you can see the um, vestibular nerve and the cochlear nerve. The co cochlear nerve is what's going to handle hearing, whereas the vestibular nerve, that is what's going to handle your equilibrium. Um, and then within the uh, oval window at the labyrinth there, that in the round window, this is where your signal gets transmitted through. So labyrinthitis, which we'll see here in a short, it's just an infection of the inner ear, an infection that you won't be able to necessarily identify. So that's why I'm kind of moving through this pretty quick. All right. Um, yeah. Assessment again, unique to uh, after doing your primary, look for drainage, excess uh, earwax, inflammation, stuff like that. Tinnitus, I mean, we've all probably experienced that to some degree. Uh, dizziness, any of these wounds, swelling, drainage, that could be an indication of trauma. We're, uh, we won't rule that out, but um, we're not going to have an otoscope. Um, impacted cerumen, this is a earwax, too much earwax in the ear canal. As a paramedic, you're probably not going to recognize that. Again, most of these things are not going to be unique. That's why, or I mean, significant. So that's why I'm moving through them. Just kind of like, hey, you could get too much earwax in your ear and not be able to hear. Labyrinthitis. This is an infection um, of the ear itself, of the um, inner ear. So it could cause tinnitus. It could cause a problem with hearing. Um, it could cause a problem with balance or something like that it, because it's going to um, affect both the cochlea and the semicircular canals. So uh, an interesting way to identify labyrinthitis is the loss of hearing. Whereas a vestibular nerve irritate infection like Meniere's disease is not going to have an associated a ringing in the ears or loss of hearing. The vomiting is going to come from the dizziness and the lack of, lack of balance. All right. Um, find a position of comfort because you're going to be very dizzy due to the vertigo and probably feel sick. So here's the Meniere's disease. This is um, too much pressure in the ear or too much pressure on the um, the vestibular nerve and that resulting in um, that vertigo spinning lack of uh, equilibrium sensation. Most of the time, I'll be honest, every Meniere's patient I've treated never had somebody complain of hearing loss or tinnitus simply because the dizziness, the nausea, the vomiting, and the other associated symptoms are so much more significant that they haven't noticed the tinnitus. Infections of the outer ear. Okay, ear infections, kids have them, moving on. Uh, you know, they're gonna be grabbing at their ear. You might see a, like a kid who can't complain, who, who can't verbalize, hey, my ear hurts, that might grab on their ear. If you put pressure or touch or they lay on that side of their head, they might um, react more aggressively, or, you know, more um, significantly. So these are some of the symptoms. These are ways you would be able to say, hmm, Hey, mom, I think the reason your kid's not sleeping or so fussy is they have an ear infection. Um, you know, we need to take them, you need to take them to their primary care doctor and get that evaluated. We all have a nose. Some of us like our nose. Some of us don't like our nose. Some of us don't care about our nose one way or the other. Um, there are problems that can asso be associated with the nose. Almost none of them are uh, life-threatening. But notice how close the nose is to the brain. This is one of the reasons that a infection, upper res respiratory and sinus infections, if not treated properly, can result in meningi meningitis or brain problems. This is also why skull fractures can result in cerebral spinal fluid coming out of the nose. Good look at your sinuses also kind of explains why a uh, trauma to the face can be so uh, 
can fracture so much because your facial bones have so many openings in them. They're so hollow. All right. Um, we talked about that. We don't need to worry about that. Digital trauma. What's that mean? They picked their nose. They stuck their no finger up their nose too deep, and now their nose is bleeding. Dryness and hypertension are the other common causes. I think um, dryness can be fixed with nebulized saline of some sort and um, hypertension. Well, yeah. So when is, an, when is epistaxis or a nosebleed a concern? When the patient starts swallowing the blood and isn't able to, or in, makes himself nauseated and then um, <clears throat> risks vomiting and aspiration. Another concern with epistaxis is if the patient is on blood thinners and is not able to control the nose. It, not able to control the nose bleed. So what do we do for it? Well, I prefer the top picture. You want the kid to sit forward, the person to sit forward, allow the blood to constantly drain out of their nose. If it's going down the back of their throat, they're going to become nauseated and they likely vomit. So let the blood just flow um, freely. If it's an anterior bleed, if it's the front of their nose, like a kid picking their nose or something, have a pinch right behind the flare of the nair, right? Right at the base of the bone. If that stops the bleeding and they don't feel it in the back of their throat, cool, go for it. Uh, st stick with that. But if it's a posterior bleed up above the bone where you're not going to pinch it, you're not going to be able to control it, let the blood flow. Don't let it build up or uh, and then run down the back of their throat and make them nauseated. And don't let them blow their nose. Don't let them sniff because if they start to clot and they blow their nose, you're going to remove the clots and the bleeding starts all over again. Born bodies in the nose, yeah, they need to be removed, but they are not an emergency situation. head colds, upper air, upper respiratory, rhinocytis, rhinovirus, things like that. We see it all the time. Um, head just, you know, looks like seasonal allergies or something like that. Post-nasal drips, itchy, scratchy throat. Cool. Take some decongestant, take some antihistamines, get over it. Sinus infection. Cool. Call your primary care. Go to urgent care. Get a uh, antibiotic. Um, can't breathe through your nose. I'm sorry. All right, um, disorders of the throat. All right, so now when we move into the throat, we're going to have some bigger concerns here because this is our form of air passage. This is where our, um, this is how we breathe. And so swelling in here can become a big issue especially on the pediatric patient. So if you were to look at the pediatric throat versus the um, adult throat, the pediatric is going to have a much larger tongue, you know, so here's the teeth right here, jaw. You have a much larger tongue, upper jaw, hard palate, soft palate, uvula very narrow air passage, but then they'll have a very large epiglottis coming down into their trachea, and then their trachea will narrow significantly here at the larynx. Whereas on the adult, uvula, hard palate, teeth, their tongue is proportionately not as large, showing a more open area within their mouth. They have a smaller um, epiglottis, glottic opening, and their trachea continues down in a fairly consistent manner, whereas the pediatric trachea is going to narrow. So as you can see here, that narrowed trachea versus the wider trachea in the adult. That difference plus the posterior of their airway back here being um, somewhat different, um, the adults being having more space 
uh, pediatrics having a much more narrow posterior airway. Um, those kinds of changes means a kid is going to be more susceptible, not just more susceptible to a throat infection, but the throat infection can create greater issues for them. So, um, esophageal disorders, things that would affect the esophagus here, um, can create pressure, you know, for, and compress that trachea uh, in a pediatric, whereas in the adult, it's less likely simply because the esophagus is larger, there's more room for um, swelling and things like that. Um, acid reflux, more common in adults, less common in children. Biggest concern with esophageal reflux is the fact that patients will um, misconstrue it to be a uh, heart attack or they will think a heart attack is just GERD, uh, acid reflux. So that's your big concern there. All right, we talked about teeth. We talked about replacing teeth when they get lost uh, during trauma. So I'm not really gonna get into that a whole lot more. Here's your cranial nerves. Can't, probably not super concerning about those cranial nerves at this time. Um, some other structures within the neck. Uh, remember, around the thyroid cartilage is the thyroid gland. That thyroid gland can uh, cause endocrine problems or change with endocrine problems like a goiter. Um, but the big issue is it's very vascular and trauma to it can result in a lot of bleeding. You also have your carotids and your jugulars that will result in a lot of bleeding if trauma happens to them. There's your um, jugular veins, internal and external. Con or, excuse me, these are the carotids, not the jugulars. There's your jugulars, internal and external jugulars. So, um, when evaluating your kid, look for, um, you know, complaints of sore throat, very common, but are they drooling? Are they able to swallow? Are they maintaining that airway? Uh, sometimes that sore throat and inability to swallow, especially if their head's leaning forward, um, could indicate an enlarged epiglottis, so epiglottitis. Epiglottitis, you want to keep this kid really calm, relaxed. You don't want to... Um, get them upset and excited. Here's uh, tooth abscesses. Call a dentist, dude. <laughs> Literally Googled emergency dentists for a guy one day on scene. He's like, yeah, I got a toothache. It hurts like crazy. And I'm like, yeah, and it's going to be an hour to get an ambulance here. And the ER is going to tell you to go to a dentist. All right, so um, not a lot to be concerned of here. Yep, none of these are big life-threatening issues. They're just concern diseases that can happen. Um, thrush is um, a yeast infection, so a oral candidus. Uh, you'll see this a lot in nursing babies, but it can happen in adults too. Generally secondary to a vaginal yeast infection. But not the patient with the thrush, the patient's partner. Um, so there's your example of oral candidus. So strep throat, which will cause white patches in the on the um, back of the throat and on the tonsils, is very different than oral candidus. Uh, oral candidus or thrush, is, you can see here on the tongue. It's that yellowy and um, white substance forming on the tongue tongue and this is a uh, ye um, this is fungus this is a fungal infection the in uh, inhaled corticosteroids are an, a really interesting risk factor remember steroids reduce inflammation. They pr suppress the inflammatory and immune responses. So if a patient's using in inhaled steroids, like for their COPD or something, and they have a reduced inflammatory response in their mouth, they are at an increased risk of acquiring an infection like thrush or even strep. So good oral hygiene is very important for patients like that. So that's a good education point that you can present to your patients.
the sensation of food is deeper into their throat. So here's your um, other risk factors. See, so basically, people with reduced inflamed immune systems. Ludwig is angina. This is a um, pain in their jaw, and that jaw, that pain can go down into their uh, neck, and it's it's caused by a toothache. Um. Epiglottitis. We'll talk more about epiglottitis in the future um, with pediatric specific. Epiglottitis is almost exclusively in kids, as you can see in uh, my drawing, my wonderfully accurate and detailed drawing. The epiglottis is much larger and um, ergo floppier in a kid right versus the smaller one here in the adult um, and so that epiglottis is um, when it can when it swells can result in as you see an occlusion and a limiting of airflow perhaps I should uh, uh, right Shh. restricting that airflow behind it and uh, causing them to lean forward. They may strider a little bit, but the big thing is they're gonna have a hard time swallowing. They're gonna be leaning forward and they're gonna be drooling. Oh, I switched to webcam, not um, whiteboard. There, that's what I was trying to show you. Um, so you can see the uh, larger swollen epiglottis here and uh, with the limited air flow for epiglottitis. Sorry. All right. Um, yeah, big thing here with kids who have epiglottitis, keep them calm. Uh, this is the one time I would let that kid ride with mom uh, on mom's lap. Let ri mom ride in the back of the ambulance, whatever it takes to calm that kid down. Do not give the pediatric patient with epiglottitis uh, racemic epi. Racemic epi is contraindicated in epiglottitis. It's not effective. It's not going to change anything. It, it's only going to speed up their... Um, respiratory rate and reaction and cause further irritation. So there's no need for racemic epi in epiglottitis. Racemic epi is used for croup, which is a lower air, uh, lower airway tracheal inflammation. Um, so laryngitis, yeah, laryngitis, no big deal, right? Um, sore throat. Tracheitis, staph infections, strep infections, any of these can cause those, leading to the croup like cough. And for children, it can be croup, um, which we would treat with the racemic epi because it's causing a narrowing of the trachea. And so, with a croup infection, the patient's trachea is going to create a, um, a steeple movement here because the trachea is going to start swelling on both sides so if this is where your vocal folds are uh, let me do that the vocal folds are here and here the croup is going to start creating this narrowing there and that narrowing from the inflammation is what looks like a, a church steeple you know the peak of a church um And so that's that's where that air passage is going to be restricted flowing through here. And um, we'll, you'll get the whistling, you'll get that croup carf, cough, and that sounds like a seal bark, that <coughs> type cough. Um, and uh, they'll also be working harder to breathe. You'll have notable... Uh, airway sounds and such like that because of the increased effort required to squeeze air past that. So there's tonsillitis. 
Oh, you, you have a sore throat. Huh? Okay, let's open your mouth. Well, there we go. Tonsillitis. And those white patches that you can see in that picture are almost always strep. It's almost always an associated strep infection. Pharyngitis, same thing, back of the throat, strep infection. Most common cause of it. All right, peritonsillar abscesses. These are large abscesses in the tissue around the tonsils or in the back of the throat. For adults, they don't tend to be as big of a concern, um, but for children, they can, uh, with their restricted airway, they can get so enlarged that they cause um, uh, occlusions of the airway. They can rupture spreading infectious material throughout the GI tract and cause quite a problem there. So these may be a uh, surgical concern. All right, Tempor uh, TMJ, temporal mandibular joint disorders. These are uh, soreness in the jawbone, uh, at the jaw joint, and uh, could be a dislocation. Tends to come from people who clench their teeth. Um, nothing we're gonna do pre-hospital. So like I said, this was a fairly straightforward and easy to cover chapter. Didn't need to spend a lot of time on it, so um knocked that one out and there you go